Welcome again to the official Cyblogs podcast. I'm Elf. I'm Amy. We're trying, once again, something slightly different this week. So, uh, to give you an overview of what we're going to kind of cover today, we're going to pick some uh, some major articles and discuss them in a little bit more detail than we usually do, and then you just give you a brief heads up on a few other things that we've picked up via Cyblogs and around the web for the past week. So to start off with, I'm going to be talking about uh, a paper in Nature called the observation uh, observation rather of the dynamical Casimir effect. <laughs> and if you don't know where that is, you're in good company. <laughs> then I'm going to talk about a, uh, a nanotechnological car, the first one of its kind. Um, and then I'm going to probably digress into something about stem cells. Fantastic. Alrighty. Uh, well, we'll both be chatting as well about the research um, honours uh, dinner and awards that took place this week in New Zealand. I'm also going to be introducing you guys to the world's lightest material, um, something of a stash happening over a nature science fiction piece penned, funnily enough, by one of my old lecturers. And of course, the latest results coming from Opera around the faster than light neutrino hoo-ha that's happening at the moment as well. Right, well, take it away, Amy. You might as well jump in and get started. Alrighty then. Well, uh, I'm, I'm hoping Elf will join me in this. Uh, this this last week, in fact, uh, very excitingly, it's New Zealand's top science um, awards. And they were handed out on Wednesday night, I believe it was, Elf. Uh, uh, yes, yes, it was. After we met at the McDermott Media Soiree. After we did. It was lovely. It's always nice meeting people, you know, like working scientists who are doing like cool stuff. But um, so so the big news, uh, not that it's not always big news every year when these are awarded, but the top prize, so New Zealand's top prize, it's the it's called the Rutherford Medal and comes with $100,000 as well from the government, which is a not insignificant amount of money. For the first time in its 20-year history, and the 20-year history of the medal, went to a woman, which is fantastic. Uh, Professor Christine Winterbourne, in fact, she is a Christchurch biochemist and won it for, uh, amongst other things, her groundbreaking work into free radicals. So what exactly are free radicals? Amy? Well, <laughs> to give the very, very, very brief rundown here, uh, she was actually, uh, I don't know if she was the first person or one of the first people to show that free radicals are produced by cells um, just during a normal part of cells biology, but they're also, they're, they're very damaging to cells. Uh, whenever you take things that say they're antioxidants, the idea is that part of what they're trying to combat is these free radicals uh, running around. Basically, they're, they're, uh, I'm not going to go into the details on this one, but, but suffice it to say that, that they're uh, very active uh, little molecules, which means that if they come into contact with other proteins or other molecules, that they can cause a fair amount of havoc. And they're consistently generated uh, yes. within your body by the action of the giant glowing ball of gas that our planet orbits, right? Uh, I believe so, yeah. And just, I mean, <laughs> it's like anything. If, if you're going to metabolize stuff, there's going to be some level of, of, of uh, other materials caused during the process. There's certainly a lot of research going into um, what to do about free radicals and, and Professor Winterbourne's done a lot of work apparently in um, documenting some of the chemical reactions of free radicals that occur in diseases such as cancer, stroke, uh, coronary heart disease uh, and arthritis. Uh, so she's a lovely lady and um, she, uh, the Science Media Center, the New Zealand Science Media Center uh, interviewed her afterwards. Elf, do you wanna take us through a couple of the things she said? Yeah, sure. Um, so she commented on being the first woman to win the medal uh, in its 20-year history. And uh, the lovely guys, our friends at the Science Media Centre, asked her whether they thought that this was because of some form of discrimination. And her, her response is, is quite charming, actually. She said, I don't think it is. It's really just a matter of statistics. If you look at the people who have been awarded this medal, they're all pretty mature. If you think of the time when they started their careers, it was at times where women were very much in the minority in science. When she did her degree in chemistry, uh, there were only, she says that there were only four out of some 30 people in the class that were in fact women. <laughs> so That's quite stunning. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of my physics classes. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, yeah, so she's she's really cool. And having just, of course, gone and looked up a little bit about free radicals, uh, yeah, the dominant theory at the moment is that um, as they accumulate over time, they're a large part of the damage that happens as one ages. So being able to do something about those, of course, is anti-aging, which is, is good. Um, yeah, so she's great. And there were some other uh, awards... This I had uh, just before we move on. Mm. Sorry, I, I have I'm just flicking through the Science Media Center article, <laughs> and she is she's just an absolute she's a, gem. Yeah, she is. She's 
So just some of the things she said. She says, if you're a scientist, follow your curiosity. Yeah. Science is an exploration. Be curious and excited on a day-to-day -day basis. And then she also goes on to say that science is completely unpredictable, mm. which, as most of us know, is true and irritating in the extreme. <laughs> and, and as part of the follow your curiosity, she makes the point as well that that sort of science funders need to keep on supporting blue skies research, which is often where a scientist becomes curious about something and, and wants to spend an amount of time, sometimes a considerable amount of time following up on something as a, with, without there being a clear commercial or otherwise benefit from it. Um, and a lot of amazing stuff has come out of that. So interesting to see someone as well who's doing very, very sort of concrete work, um, nonetheless still coming down for basic research. Oh, yeah. Um, the, since that advanced technology report came out um, I have had the pleasure of talking discussing it with a number of scientists and regardless of whether they're theorist, theoreticians, regardless of whether they're experimental, experimentalists applied or entirely unapplied they all sit on that side of the fence mm. they think that blue skies research is crucial and all the evidence backs it up. <laughs> it, it does. I can understand that from the funders, funder's point of view too, uh, saying, well... <laughs> hmm. It's difficult to justify, particularly in election year. Particularly. So interesting to see that. Um, congratulations again to, to Prof Winterborn there. Just wonderful to see. Um, so the dinners also... Oh, sorry, not the dinners. I'm, I'm being an idiot. Uh, the, uh, the research honours also involved three new awards this year. Um, there was the inaugural Callahan Medal, uh, which is for an outstanding contribution to science communication. Now, that's obviously named um, in honor of Professor Sir Paul Callaghan, himself an amazing science communicator in New Zealand. And he handed it to uh, Professor Sir Peter Gluckman, who's the chief science uh, advisor. <laughs> How do we feel about that, Amy? I think it's fantastic. I think it's fantastic as well. I think it's really um, cool. As the first ever science advisor, Peter Gluckman's just done a, a stand-up job, I think. He has. And science communication isn't only with the public, it's also with politicians. So, but, you know, <laughs> even if he doesn't have a bi-weekly column in, in the Herald or whatnot, he is spending, and, and I'm not saying that he should have, um, he's spending an awful lot of time with politicians and with our leadership, no doubt helping them to understand scientific issues in context. Uh, and that's remarkably valuable. Mm. The next... Uh, inaugural uh, medal that was awarded is the McDermott medal <laughs> after Alan McDermott, <laughs> which is I guess why I should mention this. And this went to uh, Dr. Gary Evans from Industrial Research Limited out in um, Lower Heart. Dr. Evans is a chemist and he's a pioneer in the field of designing and synth synthesizing um, a wide range of different pharmaceuticals for treatment of major diseases. Um, uh, that was handed over by Dr. Garth Carnaby who's president of the Royal Society in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. and just because uh, the clinical trials of these compounds that uh, Dr. Evans has actually synthesized are now in clinical trials uh, throughout the world for a bunch of different diseases. Um, yeah, really, really top stuff. I mean, um, so pharmaceuticals looking at the treatment of gout psoriasis uh, and cancer of the immune system. And apparently he's got drugs that are preclinical um, for treating malaria, bacterial infections and solid tumor cancer. So the man does some impressive of work in that respect. Nice, very nice indeed. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm feeling kind of useless about my own branch of science at the oh. moment, which is very strange for me. <laughs> they all have their benefits. And in fact, this medal is, is for outstanding scientific research, which demonstrates the potential for application to human benefit. So it makes sense. Um, and then finally, and this is very interesting, was the inaugural Humanities Aranui Medal, which is well, is going to be awarded annually for research or innovative work of outstanding merit in the humanities. So this includes conventional academic research as well as work in the creative arts. So that's language, history, religion, philosophy, law, classics, linguistics, literature, cultural studies, media studies, art history, film, drama, the, the whole gamut <laughs> of the humanities. So I have to say one medal for, for a, a field of yeah, study that large is quite, I imagine it will be thoroughly fought for, shall we say. Um, <laughs> That's one way of putting it. Uh, but this, <laughs> this, uh, so the inaugural one, very interestingly, was um, awarded to Professor Jim Flynn of the Department of Politics at the University of Otago for his work in political philosophy. Um, he's best known for his discovery of uh, historical gains in IQ, intelligence quotient, uh, which is now, in fact, known as the Flynn effect. And it states that IQ scores increase over time, which, as I'm sure we can imagine, has, has some interesting implications. Um, that's that's 
just just to say that's uh, over over time in terms of historical context, not over a time in a human life. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's that's over the ages. Um, which which I I can see how that makes a little bit of sense. Uh, <laughs> you you would hope so because that's not necessarily and that's an average in the population yeah. rather than individuals. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so and he's also apparently worked into um, uh, or looked rather into the nature nurture debate, and. Uh, Yes, he has written, as I'm going to quote directly here, he has written extensively about the relationship between the IQ gains he has discovered and issues of democracy, equality, and human rights. In addition, he has challenged fundamental theoretical assumptions about intelligence. And this from a political philosopher, which is also fascinating. So congratulations, everybody who, and, and there were a number of other people, of course, who got awards. Um, we don't have the time, unfortunately, to go through all of them, but, but go and have a look. Um, all the winners are up there, all for outstanding work. Congratulations, everybody. And again, all the links that you need are in our uh, show notes yes. uh, up yes. on Cyblogs at some stage on Monday. <laughs> Indeed. Alrighty. So um, from that, uh, I have something very quick before uh, Elf starts explaining some very, very interesting things to us. And this is just sort of, th this goes into the like silly physics porn section. Um, scientists have apparently invented the world's lightest material. Now, of course, every time they do this, it's the world's lightest material. But this is really interesting. This is even or possibly even lighter than aerogel. Um, apparently, the new, it's, it's an ultralight metallic micro lattice. Um, and it's 100 times lighter than styrofoam. Apparently, it's 99.99% air uh, or a thousandth of, sorry, a thousandth of the density of water for example. Um, so what makes this uh, material so strong is that it's made out of a lattice. Lattices are immensely strong. If you think about um, a lot of structures from a wine rack, for example, to um, even how your knee is put together, this is a lattice. And the same thing with this lovely new material. It's a lattice of interconnected hollow tubes. Um, and each tube has a wall thickness a thousand times thinner than a human hair. And uh, and even more than being super light, there's a picture of it here resting, uh, a piece of it resting on the head of a dandelion. And the dandelion's fine, <laughs> which is kind of oh, cool. Oh, that's just cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, um, it's also really resilient as well. So researchers have said that when it's squashed to half its height, it then rebounds 98% of the way back. So, wow. so that could be really, really useful basically for uh, impact protection. And you can see that that could be used uh, in the aerospace industry in acoustic dampening, possibly they're saying in battery applications. I, I don't understand enough about that, but fair enough. Um, and it also, surf, surf, it's a surface area issue. The more oh. surface area you have, the more uh, energy that you can store per unit area, Perfect. per unit volume. Well, there, there you go. That's why we have the physicist on board. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it even behaves like a feather when it's dropped. Uh, it takes it takes more than ten seconds apparently to hit the ground if you drop it from shoulder height. <laughs> well, that's amazing. Is it particularly because um, it's made out of metallic? Most aerogels are quite thermally insulating as well mm. because you know full of air and the air is not a great conductor of heat. Do you know if it's the same for this? I, I do not. Um, they did say that that one could make it from a range of materials, so I have no doubt that that this could be tweaked enormously. To, to give a range of, of different types of applications. Um, I think the, the idea here partly is to show that, that structurally this can be fabricated at all and made. It's, it's absolutely stunning. Oh, and for anybody who, who is interested in aerogels, um, if you have a look on the website Hackaday, uh, uh, yes, there is a pretty easy to make recipe there for making your own aerogel. Which is where the rest of my evenings are going this week. <laughs> Aerogel's fantastic stuff, and it costs a fortune. So, you know, anything that can help us make it at home is good. Yeah, absolutely. Indeed. Alrighty. 